The first question is to Rick Potts. What do you think of the implications of the studies of the emergence of modern humans and climate instability in that context for our fate in the face of anthropogenically influenced climate change today? That's an excellent question. In fact, uh, in a um, little conversation I had with the graduate students uh, last night uh, in the anthropology department, I was uh, focused uh, a number of my, my thoughts about that. Uh, the, the whole question uh, that has been raised here about um, this tension that exists between adaptability and extinction, I think, is a, a very important one. and. Uh, I think that what we see with regard to trying to understand uh, the origin of, um, of human adaptability is that we are a, a species, part of our, the nature of who we are as homo sapiens, is that we have come through a, uh, the, these periods of uh, dramatic um, landscape resource uh, change, changes in the distribution of populations and, and uh, social group interactions um, through, by being a species that, is, that bases its survival on modifying the environment. And we have modified the environment in ways that are very, very small, uh, light a fire, build a little shelter, uh, plant a seed, um, wear tightly fitting clothing, uh, compared with what we see in other um, archaic hominins. Uh, and that became a way of life that was so successful that we spread around the world. And when you take local uh, changes in environment uh, and you spread around the world, that becomes the seed of, of global change. Uh, and so what we see in the present day in what's sometimes called the Anthropocene, um, that human beings have become a planetary force uh, that um, uh, we have then the interaction of human ability to modify um, uh, vast areas of landscape, of water, uh, ocean, atmosphere, um, that is, um, emanates from our fundamental um, ability to survive and be the last hominin standing, modifying our surroundings. And it is interacting with a world that we now understand through the environmental sciences that is inherently unstable. And that's an experiment that's never been tried with human beings as the new uh, factor on the block um, that can create environmental and resource uh, instability and vast changes. And so while I think that one of the most important aspects in understanding human evolutionary history is that out of the however many species you count, that those all represent ways of life that no longer exist on Earth, even though they had a fractional humanity, that we are now, as the last biped standing, um, dependent upon modifying our environments, creating the new theme, but is the same old theme as has existed throughout human evolutionary history, uh, which is um, how uh, we will be able to, as a species, endure um, even though we are incredibly adaptable, but endure uh, in this new experiment of bringing uh, our ability to modify the environment uh, to an Earth that is inherently unstable. Uh, this is a question, I guess it would be Chris Stringer who could approach it best. How would you reconcile possibly being behaviorally modern before anatomically modern humans emerge? Does morphology take a backseat to cognition? So I guess the disconnect between um, evidence for behaviorally modern activities and anatomically modern humans. Um, yeah, I, th I think the problem is how we, we diagnose uh, both modern humans anatomically and diagnose them behaviorally. And, and what I've come to realize is that you know, these are complex things. and. We, even anatomically, um, I started by using the Bill Howells data set to diagnose what was a modern human in terms of cranial shape. And as Alison mentioned, even when you get back 20 or 30,000 years ago, you start to find what seem to be modern humans, but they're outside the range of, of the Howells data set. And by the time you're back at something like Herto, 
it's, it's, it's a huge specimen and, and in shape terms is outside the range even further. So the problem is that even modern humans, as we see them morphologically today, are, are only a subset of the variation in our species uh, 20 or 30,000 years ago. Um, and I think it's very difficult when you're looking at the small samples of fossils we've got to actually you know, draw a line and say, okay, everything after here is, is anatomically modern. And, and nothing before is. That's, it's not simple. OMO1, for me, morphologically, falls into the skeletal range of, of modern humans. And yet, after that time, uh, we find something like Iwo Eleru, which actually is further away from modern humans and is only 13,000 years old. So it really shows up the problem of, of diagnosing what a modern human is. Uh, behaviorally, Yes, uh, as a non-archaeologist and, and, and not someone working in cognitive sciences, uh, from the outside it may look simpler to diagnose what a modern human is uh, through behavioural complexity, through planning depth, um, through complexity of stages in production of artefacts and so on. But even there it's clear that um, when we look at the archaeological record it's difficult to pin down from that data when we see that whole pattern appearing for the first time. And I suppose I'd have to put that back to someone like Alison to, to see whether she can do any better with that question than I can. But I think that there's a disconnect and yes, the evidence from Broken Hill, if the Broken Hill specimen of Homo heidelbergensis is really less than 300,000 years old, and bearing in mind the stone tools from Broken Hill, which are only poorly associated with it because a lot of them were found from spoil heaps and not they certainly weren't found with the skull. But in terms of the time range of those industries, it's likely that we had non-modern humans around during the time span of the Middle Stone Age. So even having Middle Stone Age artifacts probably means that you will have pre-Homo sapien species making those, those tools in Africa. We already know from Neanderthals there, they're making them outside of Africa. But even within Africa, it's likely that archaic humans will come down well into the time range of some of these Middle Stone Age industries, and we may find, as we found with Neanderthals now, that they're producing more complex things. Neanderthals are clearly using pigments, they're hafting their tools, they're burying their dead. So even these, as I would call them, a distinct species, are showing some aspects of modern human behavior. So uh, given the time constraints, we're going to focus on the questions that have a more specific uh, direction and a specific answer. So to Mike Hammer and possibly Ed Green, is there a level of genetic diversity or an approximate amount of time after divergence that would make inbreeding impossible? Interbreeding. Inter I'm sorry, interbreeding. Uh, when Typically, um, it's hard to say because there are species that, uh, with subspecies that go back, uh, like baboons, in the last four million years, we know there are taxa that um, interbreed, and certainly that takes us quite far back on the hominid lineage. Um, there are other examples where a single mutation might cause, cause two, two groups not to interbreed. Uh, that's unlikely for something as complex as a, a mammal or humans, but um, I think interbreeding can go on for quite some time. We know there are lots of mammalian hybrids as well that um, can be quite divergent. Um, the par parental species it can be quite divergent. So maybe Ed has something to say too. Um, not much really to add to that, um, just that there seems to be more and more this theme that things that we um, in previous traditional conceptualizations of the world as a compartmentalized species thing, we would be surprised to know that they would form viable um, hybrids. We see more and more and more that this is the case, and um, it somehow uh, tends to uh, upset us in some way because we come from this tradition, this Linnaean uh, species are in these boxes, and what it means to be in the box is you don't go outside your box, but that, that um, conceptualization is less and less reflective of what we know now in, in the world. There are 
polar bear, brown bear hybrids, and these seem to do fine. And it's happened over and over again throughout the history of these species. And we see this for um, archaic and um, modern human forms that um, at some point we, I think, uh, might do better to let go of the boxes and um, just deal with the world as it is rather than this uh, conceptualization of it that makes things easier for us uh, you know, mentally. Yeah, it's worth pointing out that the concept of species is a human invention. Evolution never had a plan to make uh, species. So question to both of you, uh, are there examples of ad ad specific advantages traits that were inherited during this interbreeding with other uh, archaic humans uh, in either Asia or Africa? That, that's, a, that's a very interesting question, and I think that's what, what uh, people like Ed and myself are looking for and others. Um, we have found one example of a, of a segment that entered the entered human population through hybridization with Neanderthal that seems to have uh, reached um, a pretty high frequency ironically, in the same place where Denisova admixture occurs in New Guinea and Australia and uh, some of the southeast, south, south, um, the islands of the South Pacific, um, that um, we've shown that is unlikely just to have drifted to high frequency. It's due to some kind of selection, positive selection. It has, it's a region of the genome that encodes innate immunity, some innate immunity genes. And this also brings in some work that Peter Parham's lab has done with HLA, another region that's involved in immunity that he claims has uh, been dramatically selected through after, after introgressing through hybridization. So the immunity genes are a good place to keep in your eye on, and uh, I believe there'll be other regions that uh, have similar, similar patterns. Um, I would just add to that, I am uh, very convinced by the Peter Parham studies because I was part of that uh, work, and um, I find it to be very convincing. Uh, but the, um, uh, as, as Mike mentioned, um, this is, very, very hot active area of research that, you know, it's, it's possible now not to just do these these statistic tests and get an overall this percentage more than you would expect and the background is 50-50, but rather localize where did uh, a segment come in from Neanderthal. Um, it's still not trivially easy to do that, but it's getting to be more and more possible. Um, what one runs up against, and I think it's worth uh, making this explicit, that um, we can see from the genomes of humans today, there are many, many fancy, sophisticated scans for positive selection to see regions of the genome where something important happened in the past that must have given a fitness advantage because it's come up in frequency, recombination has not broken it down as fast as you might expect if it was just uh, moving around neutrally. But the, the common roadblock that one gets into looking for things that either came from Neanderthal or maybe didn't come from Neanderthal is that the, these regions of the genome, they don't necessarily tell you why it was selected. So you can say, here's a region, something important happened, people died because they didn't have this version of it, but still not know what it was, what was the, the advantage that was conferred by that genetic variant. And this is a, a roadblock that's not just uh, in front of people who are looking for advantageous uh, alleles that came from Neanderthals or other archaics, but people who look for advantageous alleles just in, uh, with not this interesting history. Okay, a final question from my segment to Lynn Wadley. How old are ostrich egg water bottle technologies? What about gourds? Wouldn't this be useful for diurnal bipedalism? Lynn? The evidence from deep kloof suggests that water bottles, ostrich eggshell water bottles, are 100,000 years old. So I think I can answer that very quickly. Okay, the distribution of questions is very interesting. I have a lot of questions for Chris Eret. So um, I could, I'm going to try to combine some of them. Um, one that sort of deals with the complexity of language. Um, for genetics and behavior, diversity increases through time, but your argument about consonant, consonant systems, maximum diversity is at the base of the tree. And then someone else asks, and why? And someone else asks, what's the most efficient language? 
um, which depends on how you define efficiency. Um, but how do we end up with some, I think I'm reading this, how do we end up with something as complicated as English with all its irregularities and spelling problems? So if you could um, come up and address the base of the tree and then the, com the, the uh, efficiency. Different things about what do, we, what do we mean by complexity, but we're talking just about one sort of thing, consonant systems. And there are, there are two different directions that we can see this. You can actually show by the history of any language family that we've done reconstruction in that you always get back to a more complex system, nearly always, once in a while there are exceptions, a more complex system in the proto-language than in any of the daughter languages. So you can do it individually. But uh, Atkinson's article shows this, that you can see it systematically across the world, and one has to argue that. Why? There was a question of why would that be true? Well, <clears throat> it goes back to something I said around the middle or getting past the middle. Um, there are some kinds of sound subsystems, consonant subsystems, that uh, sound changes come along and recreate, even you've lost them, new sound changes come along and recreate those. But there are some kind of subsystems that, once they're lost, do not seem uh, to be easily recreated by the, any of the usual sound change histories that happen in languages. Clicks are one, uh, pharyngeal consonants are another. Uh, lateral affricates, if you've heard um, going through the four corners, if you've listened to a Navajo broadcast, You'll hear tls and and tls and so on. When those sounds go, they tend not uh, ever to come back. Uh, ejective sounds, implosive sounds. Uh, an ejective would be like do you have you if you had an Ethiopian uh, the flatbread. It's made from t um, now I'm not gonna be able to speak from tf and tf has a t at the beginning. This is a ejective sound. And uh, what tends to happen is those goes, those, when they're gone, uh, they don't, it is possible to read, there are sound changes that can recreate those, but they tend not to be. So there's a whole bunch of sets like that. And you go to an African language family like Khoisan, and it's got all of them. And the Afroasiatic family has all of them, actually, when you get back to Proto-Afroasiatic. Uh, but as you go to the present, one or another system will disappear. And so, yeah, for some reason, and, and my argument would be that when human beings were trying, when they were first getting beyond whatever pre-modern human language would have been, which would have been, but surely had words, been able to yell out danger, uh, could talk about a few things. But to get to the full complexity of our throats, which is a, a relatively late development too, to do all the sounds we can do, and developing the full uh, range of expression for all the human things we think and feel and do, uh, this is a time where I would see people as bringing in, drafting into use all the, as they try to create all the thousands of new words they need. They draft into use every kind of utterance they can make with their mouths. So that's why I would see uh, earliest human language as being, uh, why it makes sense that you'd have the most consonants then. And then I'm missing, uh, Oh, look, look, we can do efficiency and we can do English and so on. Actually, English is not a complicated language. You know what's complicated about English? It's having that silly spelling left over from Chaucer's time. If we would fix up spelling, English like Chinese are languages that are potentially, because they've got rid of complex uh, conjugations and so on, those are potentially easier languages to learn. English went, uh, didn't, we didn't have spelling. It's not one of the most complex languages in the world. Uh, but maybe Chinese or something like that is even the more efficient, whatever that means, because uh, they're isolating languages. You simply learn the words in the order to put them together, and you can say all the things you want. You don't have to learn, oh, try, try learning uh, Finnish or something, where you have all these different uh, things you have to do with the nouns. So, yeah, uh, me, English is not so bad. Let me ask my last Chris Eric question here. Actually, there were more, but, but who pick? Um, any thoughts about the language of Neanderthals? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think there's a great transition. One of the things I look at, that I've looked at and seen, and actually somewhere in not all that professional a publication, but it was fun to do it, um, 
the interesting thing, and it came out here, it did show up if you think back about some of the things told here. The uh, Neanderthals uh, are in uh, the, the Levant, the Eastern Mediterranean world. And then we have, uh, we have modern humans come in to the region. People appear to be anatomically modern, not Neanderthal. And then the Ice Age, the last Ice Age takes off and we are people that are like, most like us leave that area and the Neanderthals come back in. So I would have to argue that uh, what we had at that point 100,000, 80,000 years ago, was not yet full syntactical language. We didn't have the capacities uh, to organize uh, in uh, the, the, the sort of um, the uh, intangibles, the, the uh, abstract things we can do to create all kinds of relationships and cooperative relationships among each other. I think that's the advantage that the uh, human expansion people like us across the rest of the world had. The Neanderthal language, I would understand, as one that had the ability to uh, communicate a lot of things, but really didn't have the abstract language capacities we have. They had, you know, they obviously did with the tool making, have a bunch of capacities to uh, do things about uh, projecting ahead and knowing what they were making and so on. But I would suggest that it's uh, the, the syntactical capacities may not quite have been there. And that's what made the problem for them. And that shows up in Neanderthal communities or groups, residential groups. They're smaller. They don't have the big group, biggest groups as human beings do. And I think that uh, that's reflected in maybe the language not having the human social organizi organizing capacities that our language has. So. OK, I have one question for Ian and one question for Ofer. So let me ask the Ian question first. Um, if becoming human requires attention in part of, spite of distraction, what are we doing by increasing the speed and frequency of distraction, e.g. technological change in gadgets? How are we um, re doing something with our brains, and how are we likely to lose capacity? Are we also likely not to be able to override emotion? Distracting emotion. Don't know about you, but I can always override emotion. <laughs> um, the, 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 the simple answer to the question is uh, about the future is the whole nature of evolution is such that we can't predict anything about the future in terms of evolution. But in terms of what the sort of argument I was producing today predicts about the way we might interact with something like technology, um, the joke is that um, Barnard's model has got nine subsystems and that Macaulay's would say that the next stage of evolution is system 10, which many people thought was a backward step. Um, but Seriously, the, the point is, I think, that b the technology permits us to move the um, memory capacity outside the body. And that's actually something that we know about, that there is now a huge literature, which some people trace to Merlin Donald, about symbolic storage outside the body as being a particularly human thing. But the brain still has to, cog human cognition still has to interact with that stuff outside. And so the fact that it's outside the body is sort of irrelevant. It, it becomes an extension of the body. Um, I hope that's enough uh, of an answer. OK. Um, finally, for Ofer, I have a question. Um, there are a limited number of ways to chip a rock into a tool. Couldn't your migration idea simply be parallel inventions by people that have already migrated? The answer is no. <laughs> the whole idea that there are only a limited number of uh, making stone tools is absolutely wrong. And it was suggested by people whom I generally call amateurs. And the reason. <laughs> And the reason for this is that they never saw the amount of variability in which you can make 
all kinds of stone tools. And I'll give you just a few examples. For example, we all know the simple uh, chopping tools, especially if you take one cobble, river cobble, and you hit it from one side, you remove about four or five flakes. This kind of stone tools is very common in, in Africa and also in parts of Asia, the very early part of uh, human evolution. But it is suddenly reappeared, but only as one side chopper, contrary to what in the literature you read about chopping tools where they hit it bifacially from both sides. After the late glacial maximum, some 20,000 years ago, most of South China and Southeast Asia went into high production of bamboo. And for producing piece, anything from bamboo, what you need is one side chopper with a few flakes. And this, we published it in Quaternary International in 2012 or 13. And you can read all about it because we re-experimented with this. The, the idea that uh, in China some purpose used, some tools were used for use of bamboo, and this would explain why there are no other sophisticated pieces, is we, we demonstrated that the old idea that was published in the 50s was actually correct, just nobody bothered to really experiment with it. So here is one, just one example. On the other hand, in northern China, at the same time, People were doing somewhat similar to what Ian described here, Ian Davidson described here for, uh, for Tasmania, that they take a rock and they get a piece of it, and the, these rocks had to be more or less siliceous ones like uh, a flint or chalcedony and so on. They heat treated it, and then by pressure flaking, they removed small bladelets. And this is what is known in, in North America here, as the microblade industries, because this term, term was adopted both by the Chinese, the Russians, and the, and, the, and the Siberians. Now, because of the word microblades, people think that these are the microlids which are common further in most of Eurasia and also in Africa. No, because they are not retouched. That's the whole point. They keep them as small, very thin, very uh, uh, narrow, um, uh, bladelets, sharp, like razor blades, and then they fit them into uh, bone handles and wooden handles and so on. So what it means is that when people uh, uh, learn one kind of operational sequence, operational sequence, which is in French, chain opératoire, means that you get the rocks, and then you have already a design, a planning that what to do, what will be your end products, and your end products can be either a special piece that you make from either the flakes or the whole rock itself, but it could be also some kind that another stage in the production is needed in order to use it. And I think you heard about some wonderful examples from, from the work of Lynn Waitley in South Africa. So therefore, basically, these operational sequences, it's like writing, it's like learning languages. They are learned by certain society. And when this society changed or if you because you probably don't like the, the word exterminated or died out so when this chachais is disappears from the record the whole technique can disappear look at the south african record between the steel bay the hovison sport the post hovison sport and so on and so forth you can see this within within for example in the levant i didn't talk about the ashelo yabrudian which is the end some kind of end of a Chilean, cut off when you have these Mosterian Levalois technology industries, when these disappear, you have a new upper paleolithic blade industries, although the knowledge of making blades, as you heard from Ellison, was already in Africa half a million years ago. So uh, therefore, there is no one way of working your stones because the question is, what are you going to do with them? And according to this, you have many, many different ways, not to mention for you the differences between Clovis, Folsom, and all the rest. Okay? I hope it's good. Thank you. Thank you.